So as Will said earlier, uh, the family group leaders are going to another room to learn how to successfully facilitate a family group. And the rest of us are in here to learn about being a member of a small group. That may seem to be kind of uh, self-explanatory or whatever, but a lot of us have, have kind of forgotten about what that's like. It is not systemic to one region or another, but across the whole church, which is why we're talking about it. And um, I include myself in that number because I don't need a small group. So I'm, I'm right here with you guys. I'm a member of a group. And uh, the first question is, you know, why do we have small groups? You know, Will last midweek talked quite a bit about the history of our churches and small groups and things. But really, small groups are not exclusive to our church or to any particular denomination. Um, you know, because many different churches utilize small groups. Why? Because they're biblical. You know, right back to when God first divided the nation of Israel into 12 tribes, you know, he broke them into smaller groups. In Exodus 19, excuse me, Exodus 18, verse 21, you know, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, comes to see Moses just being swamped by people with every need there is within the whole nation of Israel. And he tells Moses, select capable men from all the people and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. He broke them down into smaller groups. Flash forward to the New Testament. You know, Jesus had his 12 disciples and within that group of disciples, he had three that he was particularly close to. He broke them down into an even smaller group. And even when there were thousands coming to him to be taught, thousands coming to be healed, to be fed, he still maintained the intimacy of the small group. He had his 12. In Mark 6, 7, Jesus takes those 12 and he breaks them into smaller groups and sends them out two by two. Nehemiah tells us that Jerusalem's walls were rebuilt by small groups, working specific sections of the wall. You know, the, um, the modern church, the walls of the modern church are not built necessarily of brick and mortar. They're built by the relationships of the Christians, primarily within small groups, because that's where you get that intimacy to build those relations with. So as the group leaders are being trained, like I said, about the path forward for our family groups, you know, we have to look at the expectations for, for the family groups, you know, for meeting in group devotionals, for serving the poor as a group. And uh, the family group leaders, they're gonna leave tonight with a clear picture of what's expected to lead a family group in the Potomac Valley Church. And I hope to give you that same clear picture of what it means to be a member of a family group in our church. But a group, you know, it's made of both its leaders, but really it's also made of the members. And so that's what I wanna talk about for the rest of tonight. So, I'm looking around. Mike Lawson, you have a t-shirt on. Could you please stand? So spin around, do the little slow thing. What does it say on the back of the shirt? Gather, serve, multiply. That's right, gather, serve, and multiply. Thanks, Mike, for modeling for us there. You know, in our church, we gather, we serve, and we multiply. And when I went to Maryland for um, the ICOC 3.0 conference a few weeks ago, that was one of the things that was asked. People saw our t-shirts, they were like, gather, serve, and multiply. Do you teach that? Do you practice that in your church? And if so, how? And that's what part of tonight's about. That's why we relabeled things from Bible talks to family groups, because we don't want it to just be a slogan on the shirt. You know, we want it, we want to be able to live that out. And then, you know, that's one of the reasons we changed the name from family group to Bible talk. Bible talk, it care, you know, labels matter. If you call something a Bible talk, it carries with it a very specific connotation that, okay, I'm just gonna sit down, I'm gonna study scriptures with people, and that's pretty much it. Family group offers more dynamics to it, and that's what we're after. We're after more dynamics with the, with the small groups than you know, simply using a group as an evangelistic tool for visitors. And if you are visiting with us this evening, I wanna let you know that, if it's not already clear, that in Potomac Valley, we have an expectation that every member will be a participant in a small group, a family group. So let's talk about the first one of those, gather. You know, the small group is a micro representation of the larger church. And so the things that apply to the larger church apply to the family group. If you can't well, please turn to Acts 2, verses 46 through 47.
and it reads, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. This is the first century disciples. They gathered, they showed up. They showed up at the temple courts and they showed up to break bread together and to praise God together. If you commit to being a family group member, then you have to show up to the small group. You have to show up for the gathering. You know, and I know there are people who, who consider small groups that have, you know, coming along up till now to have been an optional thing. And that's not the case anymore. You know, we're, we're like Will said, you know, we kind of put the boat in the water and we see where, the, where it takes on water at, and now we're catching. So, you know, these guys, they came together, they broke bread in their homes, and there's no place more inviting more intimate than a person's home. You know, if you want to, your visitors, if you want your fellow disciples to feel welcome, to be at ease, then you meet in a home. Because, you know, meeting at other places can sometimes take on the feel of being a little bit maybe too business-like, right? It's, that doesn't feel like home. It's not building family. You know, that home is where the hearts are touched at. And they praise God together. You know, you come to a family group, you need to be prepared to dig into God's word. The family group setting is a time to praise God. You know, it's not a time to deal with, you know, a discipling issue or something like that. You know, if, if you have an issue that's pressing, then come prepared to stay late to deal with that. You know, it's not a time to be surfing your Twitter account or your Facebook or texting your friends. Um, you know, if your electronic device is out, then the only active screen should be your Bible app. You know, and I say that, you know, that sounds like something we should be talking to the teens about, but I've seen adults do it. I've seen adults in this congregation do that, sit in services, sit in family groups, surfing on their phones. And, you know, that's not what you're there for. That's not part of gathering. You've got to gather physically, but you've also got to gather mentally and emotionally. Okay. And if the family group is a micro-representation of the larger church, you know, like I said, those expectations for the larger church hold true. If you go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians 13, and while you're turning there, I'll tell you, you know, Paul, he found cause to tell the church in Corinth how disciples should treat one another. And 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13, it's familiar to most of us, you know, and the world is kind of, it's one of the scriptures the world is kind of hijacked in a way, you know, you see it on posters, you see it on plaques, talking about love, things like that. But when you read it in context of the way it was written, it's talking about how disciples should treat one another, how Christians should have a relationship with one another. And specifically, verses 4 through 7, they read, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Put your name there instead of the word love. So that in my case, just to start with, it would say, Patrick is patient, he is kind, he does not envy, he does not boast, and on, on it would go. This is how we should treat one another in the church. This is how we should treat one another within our family groups. You know, and when I put my name there, I'll be honest with you, I come up short in some of these areas. And I need to change that in my character. I need my family group to help me with that, to help overcome blind spots. We all have blind spots to what's in our character. And I need others to come in and help with that. Um, you know, because otherwise I can't grow to be the disciple I'm supposed to be. I can't grow to become the best family group member I can be as a ligament of that particular body. So put your own name in there, grade yourself. And if you need to repent of some things, you know, that gives you something to talk about with your discipling partner. It gives you something to talk about in a devotional group, you know, to, and it gives you something to work on. It gives you a, a spiritual goal to work towards. So we've gathered, next was, we serve. So turn to Philippians 2, 5 through 8. And 
Philippians 2, 5 through 8 reads, my version reads, Your attitude should be the same as that of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. You know, it says that Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He was humble. It says that he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. He was a servant. It says he humbled himself and became obedient to death. You know, Jesus put others first. He put me first. He put you first. You know, to go to the cross, to die on the cross so that we could be reconciled with God. I mean, that's the ultimate of putting others first. You know, that's the ultimate of a servant, the ultimate of being humble. I mean, because Jesus, he was a son of God. I mean, he could command legions of angels. And if there was ever anyone who was entitled to respect based upon their life or their position and things, it was Jesus. But he was humble. There was no entitlement. You know, we um, sometimes fall into the tra entrapment of thinking we're entitled to something whether it's based on our spiritual age, our physical age, our income bracket, our profession, whatever. You know, but without Jesus, we're entitled to nothing but damnation and death. You know, if the whole group, you know, were to be like that, just imagine where your group could be. You know, being a humble servant who puts others first, it means doing your part for the group. It means being willing to help plan for things like childcare within the group. It means being willing to offer to contribute to the menu for the night if you're serving food that night. You know, it's not always up to just one or two people to do all that. It's not just up to the leader, leadership to do that. And again, just think if your whole group was humble, were humble servants, putting others first, because a group like that will naturally start to look outward to see what other needs are out there that can be met. You know, looking out into the community to see where the needs of the poor are at. It translates into serving the poor. Each family group tonight, or coming up in the next weeks here, is gonna be asked to set aside time to serve the poor in your community. You know, each disciple is gonna be asked to set aside time to go with that family group and serve the poor. Identify needs in your community. You know, work with your group leaders to come up with ways to meet those needs. And there's gonna be a lot more teaching on this in the fall and weeks to come. I think we're all gonna read a book together. Uh, it's called A Hole in the Gospel, Don't Run Out and Buy It, because I think the church has ordered some. I just finished it. I will guarantee you, it will rattle your cage. You know, Don Lombardo read it, recommended it to me, and. I was sharing with Christina and we should sell Kleenex for missions along with that book because it will rattle your cage. But it's all, it's all building up to us though, improving our Christian walk by being more complete and serving the poor in our community. So we've talked about gathering. We've talked about serving. What's the next one? Multiply. Multiply. Turn to Acts 11, going to verses 19 through 21. Acts 11, starting in 19, it reads, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message only to the Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them. And a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. We've all heard this many times that it's not just the leader's responsibility to go out and reach out to people. You know, and you read this passage, this wasn't Peter. This wasn't Paul. This was 
ordinary grassroots disciples like you and me out sharing the gospel. And the passage says that some only reached out to those who were like them. They only reached out to their fellow Jews and it doesn't record any level of success. But some reached out to the Gentiles, reached out to those who were different than them. And of course they had a great amount of success in saving souls. You know, the world would tell us, you know, to when we're out, we think about sharing with people or inviting them to our family group or inviting them, you know, to church on Sundays or midweeks. The world would tell us to stick with your own race, stick with your own income bracket, your own level of education, your own profession. The kingdom of God recognizes none of that. You know, we need to. If that's something that, that you're hung up with, of sticking in your swim lane, you need to break that paradigm, you know, because that's something the world has put into you. The kingdom of God is about reaching out to all men and women. And for Jesus, you know, he came to save all of us, not just a few. So we can't afford to reach out to only those who are like us. We have to be willing to reach out to anyone at any opportunity. Turn with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, starting in verse 44. And this is Jesus that we're talking about here. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. This passage, we need to treat our visitors as we treat our brothers and sisters. You know, Jesus, he noticed that he was being treated differently. Our guest they already know they're the visitor. They already know they're a guest. You know, Jesus says, you know, what he said there, you know, it was customary to give somebody water to clean their feet with, to greet with a kiss, or to give oil, offer oil for one's head. How do you treat the visitors to your family group? You know, because it's your job to make them feel like family. And don't assume that somebody else is going to do it. Because you might be the only person in the room who has that one thing in common with them to build that family relationship. You might be the only person in the room who gets that insight to break the ice to show them where they are with Jesus. Don't also underestimate your own importance. So that's gathering, serving, multiplying. Now I want to leave you with some practicals. I want you to have a dream for yourself because I look out of this room and I see a lot of disciples who are very capable of leading a small group. So I want you to have a dream for yourself to lead a healthy, growing, multiplying group that goes out and serves the poor, that builds family. I want you to pray for your family group members daily. You know, this is something I do. I pray for the members of the family group I'm in daily as well as my discipling partners, none of whom are in my family group. Be prepared for the group meeting. You know, as Will indicated, and I've talked about a little bit, going into the fall, we're gonna be talking about serving the poor. We're gonna be reading a book together, and there's gonna be a lesson that all the family group leaders will have, and I'm assuming it'll be made open to all of you as well. So there'll be no reason to not be prepared, because you will, if you care to take the time, you will know what's going to be talked about. You will come prepared to give in a constructive manner. I want you to help your family group leader plan for the activities. You know, plan to go serve the poor. Look for those opportunities in your community. You know, plan for evangelistic events. Again, it doesn't fall on just one or two people. But the greatest practical that I can give you is to be committed to your own 
personal growth. You need to read scripture. You need to be in your Bible. You need to pray, as I've said already. You need to have others in your life. You need to go back to 1 Corinthians 13. You need to check the box on those things that I need help with and then go find that help and work. set your spiritual goals. The responsibility for a great small group is not exclusively on the leaders of the people in the other room. It's on the, lead, it's on the shoulders of everybody, them and us. If Jesus visited your family group, would he know that you, that you, Randall, that you, Christina, that you, Mike, Herschel, that you are there to worship God, his father, that you are there to build the walls of his church and to save as many as possible and to add to the book of life? And if the answer is no, if the answer is maybe, what do you need to change? Because again, the success is not in the people in the other room. It takes all of us. It takes the family. You know, that's, that's what makes us a successful family group. So let me go to God in prayer as I close out.